This is an SM Media production. Things are gonna get better real soon. Yeah, I'ma just do me, you just do you. I swear it's gonna get better real soon. Don't let anyone tell you what you should do. I got a clear view. We're gonna make it soon. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of The Sit Down right here on SM Media. I'm Scott McPay, delighted to be your host as always. We've got a very special guest in this week's episode. I'm joined by a legend of Scottish football, former Rangers commander, Manchester City man, former chief executive of the SFA, Gordon Smith. Gordon, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you on to The Sit Down. Thanks very much for joining me. Pleasure, nice to talk to you Scott. Brilliant, how are you? Yeah, good thanks, yeah. Just... Uh... Having to put up with all the obviously all the problems we've got, I'm, I am getting more uh, walks in, probably more exercise in these days than I was before. You know, Brilliant. are you missing getting to a game of football? When was the last when was the last game of football you were at? Do you remember? Eh, uh, well, it's a while ago. I, I go now. I can't even remember the last one I was at. To be honest with you, I just uh, just been months and months pass, and you don't remember what games you go to. Sort of thing. So I can't remember. Brilliant. Well, take a wee look at your early career. Like, where did you where did you start out? Like, who was your first kind of boys club memories? Like, who and who were your heroes? Kind of grown up. Uh, well, when I grew up, I mean, I had heroes. It's quite funny because my parents, uh, my grandfather played for Kilmarnock, yeah. and my um, my actual uh, they, my, they used to take me to games. And what happened was, I remember going to a game, Kilmarnock game, when I was young, and I saw Jim Baxter playing, right, and for Rangers, you know. And what happened was. It, it, because he was slim like I was, I was a thin boy. I was maybe only about seven or eight years old, but I was desperate to be a football player. And I wanted to be Jim Baxter sort of thing. So what I started to do was, funnily enough, I started just to play with my left foot all the time. Right. And it was quite it was quite interesting because I was right-footed. And because I was using my left foot, and then I went to play for uh, uh, the life boy team, the boys' brigade youth, you know. And, and uh, the manager there said, you're a good wee player, son, but you're going to have to use your other foot. You're too one-footed. And he was quite surprised how quickly I could use my other foot because <laughs> I was naturally really pretty. But it was really the funny thing about it, Scott, see, see practising and getting your other foot at that age sort of thing, you then become two-footed because of that. Yeah. And the younger you can the younger you can do it, because I've seen I've seen me working professionals in my job, even in coaching, and trying to get professionals to use their other foot. And by then, I think it's too late. I think you've mm-hmm. got to do it as a kid. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you move on to come up, you scout, get scouted for Kilmarnock and how did that come up? Do you remember how that came about? Yeah, I got approached. What happened? My dad got a phone call and it was a, it was actually the same week. I got three phone calls, one from uh, Kilmarnock, but one from before that, Rangers and Celtic had both called had a, asking if they would sign S form for them. So I had the choice of three clubs and my dad said, you're going to Kilmarnock. And I said, because you're a fan? And he said, no. He says, you've got more of a chance there. Mm-hmm. And if you make it, they'll come back in for you. It was yeah. great advice at the time because my pal signed for Rangers. He, Rangers came in from my pal, David Patterson. He was a really good player too, played in the same school team and mm-hmm. boys club and all that. And he went to Rangers, but my dad had made me go to Kilmarnock. And uh, it, it worked out unbelievable, Scott. You know why? Because see, I signed at 14 years of age, right? And it was March. And, and, and what happened was when the summer holidays came around, Kilmarnock had me in training with the first team at 14, doing the full-time training. And every time there was a holiday, a school holiday, I was in training with the full timers uh, and, and not even getting put aside to do anything else. I did everything they did from that age onwards. So it helped, it certainly helped me a lot physically. And in the football terms, it did too. You know, playing alongside top players because Tommy McLean was a player yeah. at Kilmarnock when I started, and so was his brother Jim. Mm-hmm. Jim McLean was a player there at the same time. And then obviously, like the who were the kind of big influences at the club at the time? I know like Wally Fernley was a manager. Was he a big influence in your career? It wasn't really, no. The big influence was more players than, than anything else. Only Fernie, it was quite funny because it was, it was a funny story because uh, when I was playing, he, he came in as a manager and he put me on the left wing. Right. And I remember I went to see him, right? And I said to him, look, you put me in the left wing. I, I don't want to play there. I want to play more centrally. He says, oh, the reason I'm playing you there, son, he says, because you're left-footed, I need to have somebody with a left foot on the left wing. And I said, I'm not left-footed, I'm right-footed. And he said, no, you're not. So... It, it was, I, I ought to out now, Scott, it was actually a compliment. But at the yeah. time, I'm going, <laughs> imagine somebody telling me I'm, I'm left footed when I'm not. But the thing was, I ended up being on the, on the left wing. So what happened was I was playing regular. And, and the funny thing was, there was loads of talk through the years. I, I was at Kilmarnock during that spell. Loads of talk about transfers and all that. And uh, nothing happened. It was all like, oh, this, this team's interested, that team. 
And I kept thinking, it's not going to happen for me. Then, years later, I found out, and, and the most incredible one was about 15 years ago, I was at a dinner in Glasgow, and Tommy Doherty was a speaker. And Tommy Doherty said, uh, it's nice to see Gordon Smith there. I was in the, just sitting in the audience at a, a table. He says, I try to sign Gordon as Man United manager. And I went up to him after the dinner, and I said, excuse me, Tommy, what you said there? And he goes, you didn't know? I said, no. He said, I, he says, you were 19 years old. He said, I offered Command like 100,000 pounds and they accepted it it was a friday he said they accepted it and said look can we do the deal monday gordon play for us tomorrow and we'll do the deal monday and he, and he said okay he said you must have played well and i went why he says when i phoned them up on the monday they wanted more money and i'm and, and tommy doctor saying you agreed to a hundred thousand on friday that's the deal and again they kept trying to negotiate and, and eventually he says look i'm putting the phone down you he put the phone down them and there was i like retired for about 15 20 years before I find out that I could have been a Man United player. But there was loads of things like that. You know what I mean? So you, you never got told in those days. You know yeah. what I mean? The, the club obviously, the club obviously weren't telling me anything. They were getting they were getting these offers, but not telling me. Crazy. What were your highlights of your five years at Kilmarnock? Uh, I think I think this just basically uh, uh, you know playing a regular get the highlight has been a in the first team at, at 17 years of age, you know what I mean? And and I was still at school, I was doing my hires. And I was I was actually playing in the team alongside my PE teacher at the same school I was at, George Maxwell. The two of us were in the first team together. And on, on a Monday, he's my he was a teacher and I'm a pupil in the school. But that that was great to play at that age because I wanted to I wanted to break in. And it was quite funny, Scott, because a lot of people said, you know, you'll go in the first team and you'll, you know, you've been in and out of the team, you play, but I had no intention of that. When I went in that team, I was thinking I don't want to come back out. I, I was lo- enjoying it so much, playing in front of a crowd. A lot of people, I don't understand anybody that ever says they don't like playing in front of a crowd because for me, that's a big boost. To you. It's, it's fantastic. I would have hated to be playing these days now with no crowds at the games because I, I enjoyed fans there. Yeah, definitely. See, when you move on to Rangers, like, how, do you remember how that came about? Like, remember when you first get contacted about Rangers coming in to try and sign you? Yeah, I was at my work. Actually, I was working uh, in a job and Wally Fernie phoned me up and said, um, he just said, you know, uh, where are you, Gordon? And I said, well, you've wrong me. I should know. You should know. He says, no, I got your number from the secretary. I says, I'm at my work. I'm in the office. He goes, are you far from Ibrox? I said, no, really. Why? He goes, just sold you to Rangers. We'll see you there in half an hour. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, I, went, I went to Ibrox and uh, met Jock Wallace and Wally Fernie was there too. So yeah. I signed the contract and um, it was it was fantastic because I say it was ambition I had to, to play for Rangers too. And, and all of a sudden, because they, they played in the Saturday, Rangers had played Aberdeen at Petaudry and got beat 3-1, and I had played uh, I played for Comana on the Saturday, and then on the month, this was the Monday, that the phone, the, I got the phone call, and I signed on, on the Monday after that game. And obviously you mentioned Joe Wallace there, just what were your memories of him, and how big an influence was he for your career? Well, it's quite funny, because at first, you know, you've this it's a thing that sort of, everybody sort of more or less made you a bit frightened of him, because they say he was a big hard man, and Rough, but I, I found him really good to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I found he was really man management. I found he was actually great, and I, and I enjoyed playing for him. Albeit uh, the thing that was about it was it was a great season. One season I had under him, and we won the treble that year. Yeah, and you know, and and, and it worked out well for me because I scored twenty seven goals from midfield. So you know, I, obviously I was quite uh, well in with him, and he, he was pleased with me at that time. So. That was my experience, but I found him really good because I remember, uh, you know, to sum that up was, I remember we played against St Mirren. I'd been there about four or five weeks, I think, and and we were getting beat at half time. And uh, he was he was giving a bit of a row to the players, Scott, and then he, he suddenly grabbed my shirt and he pulled me out of the seat and he said, see when I say we're not playing well, I'm talking to everybody in the team. <laughs> and he put me back down, right? <laughs> Because <laughs> he must have seen, because it was going well for me, I, I'd started scoring when I went in right away. So yeah. he must have seen in my face, I'm thinking, obviously it's not me he's talking to here, you know, because I'm not playing well. But that was it. So that was a that was the first thing. And then the second thing was maybe a few months later, uh, at the end of a game, I must have been sitting there a bit down, not having played very well. And he did the same thing. He pulled, he, gro- he grabbed my shirt and pulled me out of the seat and says, he says, see when you give me the effort you gave me the day, you'll always be in this team. Now there, there's two sides of man management, really. One was the carrot, it's a carrot and the stick, isn't it? Yeah. One was putting me down when I was on a high, and one was lifting me when I was down. And that's why I've always got a great lot of time for him. And I, I think he was the best manager I played for. Probably. 
see the first season that Rangers, you you went in and Rangers won the treble. Who was the bit? Who was the kind of really good players to play with at that time? And who? What was the memories of that season? The whole team, Scott. I tell you why, because there was it was a really experienced team, and it was three newcomers in the team. It was Bobby Russell, mm -hmm. Davy Cooper, and myself. Yeah. Bobby Russell uh, was. I, I found it quite stunning to find out I, the first game I was on the bench, and we were playing young boys of Bern in a European game. I signed on Monday, this was a Wednesday night, right? And I remember saying after about 10, 15 minutes to the boys on the bench, who's our number eight again? Then they went, that's that's Bobby Russell. I went, I said, he's really good. And they said, they've signed him for Shettleson in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, for Shettleson Juniors? And that's true. And he came to Shettleson and there he was controlling a European game. So he was a tremendous player coming through. David Cooper came for Clyde Bank and, and had done really well. And Coop, and, and all in all, Coop was probably the best player but I think probably most certainly the best player I ever played with in terms of his ability. So we were the newcomers, but see the other guys around about us, they were all experienced and had been successful for Rangers over the years. So you, we weren't getting into a team with people that didn't know what it was like to win things, yeah. win trophies, because you had Peter McCloy and you had Sandy Jardin, Tom Forsyth, Colin Jackson, John Gregg was in that team, mm -hmm. Alec McDonald, Tommy McLean, Derek Johnson, first-class players to play alongside. And then obviously the season after that, you you score the winner against Juventus. Was there obviously what's your memories of that day? But is there a regret that that team didn't go further in the European Cup at that time? Definitely, yeah, yeah, definitely is Scott. Uh, we we actually had knocked out Juventus, who were favourites for the competition. Mm -hmm. They were they had they'd won the they'd won the first cup in the summer before that. So this was them in the European, but they had so many international players in the team. They'd actually, I think at that game when we beat them, they had six or seven players that went on to win the World Cup for Italy. Yeah. That's that's how strong they were. We got beat one nothing in, in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. And I'm no joking when I tell you this, it was like 1-0 going on about 10. They absolutely destroyed us over there. Peter McCloy had a fantastic game. So you never know how it's going to go at home for you. And then on the night, we beat them 2-0 at Ibrox and I got the winning goal. And it was brilliant. And it was quite funny because years later, I was in a when I was at the SFA, I was in a committee uh, with FIFA. And uh, it was ex-players. Ex and one of them, uh, he shook my hand and he said, hello, it was nice to meet you. And I said, well, met before. It was Dino Zoff, who was a right. goalkeeper that night. He says, well, we met before. And I said, yeah, I, know, I nodded to you one night at Ibrox, you know, and he laughed. And I said, he goes, were you in that Rangers team? I said, yes. I said, I scored the goal. And he was very nice about it. But he was the... He was the the main guy in the Italian World Cup team as well, Dino's off, you know. Yeah. So, but it was it was an amazing result. Then we beat Eindhoven in the next round, who were mm -hmm. who then became favourites after uh, Juventus got knocked out by us. Eindhoven became favourites. We beat them, and then we went to the quarter final. Now we had quite a gap in those days. It went from about um, August, uh, September, or October, and the, the next match was March. Right. And there was a lot of things that, a lot of things had happened, Scott, between them. We had injuries, suspensions. And we had a lot of fixtures because of the, the weather that's that winter. A lot of games had been cancelled. So right. we played the quarter final. We played Cologne in the quarter mm -hmm. final. And I honestly think we could have won the European Cup that year. We, we, we weren't ready for the Cologne game. We lost 2 1 in aggregate. And then we went on to the final. Nottingham Forest beat Malmo in the final. Yeah. So right. I, I think it does disappoint me that we didn't win that. Yeah. And what was the other kind of memories of your time, your first spell at Ibrox? Does it rank as the best time of your career? Yeah, I really enjoyed it because what happened was I realised my ambition, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, to, to play at that level, to win trophies, uh, to play, uh, you know, such good players and to play in big matches like that. That was my my, my thrill. That, that, that it, it actually fulfilled my ambition then to play there, you know. And uh, before I was transferred, I had just signed a new five-year contract a month before I was transferred. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously Brighton came in with a £400,000 offer. It was a record fee. Did you feel a bit of pressure with that, with the, how big, how high the fee was at that time? I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know at all. Right. And Because and, I, I, John Gregg, the story is John Gregg had asked me to go to Brighton to speak to Alan Mullery, the manager, because he was a pal of his. He right. says, I don't, want to say, I, don't, I don't want to sell you, he told me. So I went down to Brighton and uh, Big Davy Proven, who was a... a, a, a uh, one of the coaches at Ibrox, he came with me. I never thought anything about that. So that way, Alan Mullery, through the, he kept making me offers, and I'm saying no, no, because there was no intention of signing for Brighton. And then all of a sudden, he said, go and have some lunch. So I went for lunch with Big David Proven, and he said to me, that's some offer, Gordon, isn't it? Because at that stage, I was about three times my basic wage from Rangers with Brighton. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, it's unbelievable. And he said, 
you know, thinking of signing? I said, well, you know I'm not. He says, all right, I might as well tell you. Uh, we've accepted the deal. The deal's yeah. done. We, we've accepted. And I went, you're joking? He goes, no. So I phoned Ibrox, John Gregg, and he said, have you signed? And I said, no. He says, well, you better sign. He says, if you don't sign, I'll make your life hell. If you come back up here, he says, I'll have you in. You won't play in the first team again. Yeah, I might, you might not even get a game for reserves. I might, I'll have you in morning, noon, night training. And I said, I can't believe this. You said I was just coming down here to do you a favour. He goes, well, we've accepted it. So I went back and said to David Proven, what, what, what happened? He goes, well, we just thought because of it, we thought you'd got a better deal and you would accept it. So I had to just go back to Alan Mulloway and say, I've further think about it and I'll sign. But I don't blame John Gregg. In terms of the way he did it, was wrong, right? But I have to say, he did me a favour, Scott, because... I went down to Brighton and I, I really enjoyed my time there. I must be honest. And um, why do you think the why do you think that happened? Was it down to like Rangers wanting money or was it food, uh-huh. food? Was that what I think it was? it was just a, I think it was a fee. I think right. I think I never knew at the time it was because it was a record fee, as you say, and I think it was the most money. I think it was even four hundred and forty thousand was or something like that. So it was a record fee, and and Rangers were maybe John Gregg was going to buy players mm. with that money. So I think that was maybe the only way he was going to get money was if they got money in for a player. And that's why, and I didn't, I didn't realise that he had been in for me. I uh, found out later on he, he phoned Rangers about seven or eight times during that season, mm-hmm. trying to trying to see me, and Rangers just had kept saying no. And then all of a sudden, when it came, the money came in, the big bit, the big bid came in. Rangers decided, right, you're on your way. So I was on my way. I was 25 years of age, and that was me away. And then obviously, like, how did you find your time at Brighton? Like the early days, did you can I settle in? Okay. I, I found it really, really good. The only thing about it was quite funny. There was there was two things I didn't do when I went down there. Uh, one was golf. Another one was uh, drink. I was teetotal when I went to Brighton. 25 years of age. Never had touched a drink of alcohol. I just thought footballers shouldn't drink. And I found the drinking culture down there uh, was quite different from up here. That, uh, even though most people think Scotch people drink more. But when I went down there, I remember that the first night out with the lads, Scott, the... Uh, they said to me, what are you drinking? I went, I'll have a Coca-Cola. I went, no, we're having a drink. I said, yeah, Coca-Cola. So they said, you don't drink? I went, no. They came back from the bar with all the drinks, put the drinks down, and I said, where's mine? They said, we don't buy soft drinks. Go and get your own, <laughs> right? So the first few nights out with them, I was my own kitty, right? So that was me drinking. And uh, But I got used to, I got into eventually when I, I just thought, I've got to be one of the guys here because mm-hmm. it, was, it was a real social environment, really, because you know what happened? We all lived. At Rangers, it wasn't like this. We, we lived quite far apart from each other at Rangers. We all lived where we'd obviously, near, near all of us had been brought up or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whereas at Brighton, we, they'd signed us all and we'd all come there. So every one of us was either living in Hove, which were the, where the football ground was, or Brighton. And so it was a, we were seeing each other all the time. I mean, I used to walk to matches in a Saturday or midweek. I could walk to the ground from my house because we were that near. And about another five six players could do the same because we all lived right near the football ground. Brilliant. The 1983 FA Cup final, you, you score the first goal in the 2-2 final, the, the first game, but you, you lose 4-0 in the replay. What was your memories of those games? Uh, well, it's, it's fantastic to play and it really was. And uh, it's amazing because, it, you know, I, I'd like to be thinking, I remember walking off the field and looking up at the scoreboard at half time and it was Brighton 1, Manchester City 0 and my name was under the the scoreboard Smith and I thought I might be remembered for today and uh, I certainly am remembered for my miss in the last minute that's that <laughs> that always it's it's famous you know what I mean because it always comes up and 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 it, and it, it came home to me how famous it was when I was over in uh, we were in Kuala Lumpur when Manchester City played for Man City about three years after that final and we we're sit, all sitting around the pool and this little kid was coming around for autographs and he came up to me and he said autograph please and I said okay he signed it gave it back and he said Oh, are you Gordon Smith? And I went, I said, yeah, I am. He goes, uh, how are you missing the cup final? <laughs> <laughs> and all my teammates were falling off their beds laughing. Like, I said, did you just tell him to say that? And they went, no. And they said, we didn't. Nobody they just remember my name. Because that in those days, see the FA Cup final, Scott, used to, it was worldwide. Yeah. You know what I mean? Every, every country practically got the FA Cup final. So it was, it was something that became famous. And to this day, I, I still... I'm, I'm, it's one of my, it's my probably my biggest football regret is definitely my miss in the last minute because it was like would, uh, just after the goalkeeper saved it, he, he saved the first one with his legs, then he got the rebound, and as I turned to walk away, I'm thinking, God, I could have scored there. The final whistle went, and that that was how. That's why it's remembered because it could have been a, a great day for Brighton Football Club, 
And every time I'm down there, I apologise greatly. And people are still really nice. The Brighton fans are, are generally very nice to me about it. They always say, no, you scored the first goal. You got us to help to get us the final. But it's still something I regret greatly. And then, obviously, you, you go back to Rangers and loan. Like, do you remember how that came, came about? And what, what was the kind of experience like? It was a strange one because what happened was I got a phone call from Tommy McLean, who was assistant manager to John Gregg at the time. Mm-hmm. And he said, he said, we would let you back here, will not you, back in a month's loan? And I said, well, OK, I'll think about it. So I went to see uh, Jimmy Amelia, who was the chief scout at Brighton. And it was quite a strange one, Scott, because what happened was I said to Jimmy, I said, look, uh, Rangers want me for a month's loan. I said, I don't know what you think. And he goes, why not go up, Gordon? He says, you'll be at home over Christmas because this was beginning of December. Mm-hmm. You'll be home with your family over Christmas. And he said, I'll tell you something I don't want you to tell him. When you come back down here, he says, I'll be the manager. Right. And I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, Bill, uh, Mike Bailey's going to be sacked. Mm-hmm. He says, I'll be, I'm getting appointed as manager. So when you come back down here, he said, you'll be back in the team when you come back down. So I thought, all right. So I went back up. But the funny thing was, this is the truth. I phoned Tommy McLean. I said, I told me I've decided to come up. I said, uh, I'll see you Monday. And he went, what do you mean Monday? I said, well, I know you've got the cup final Saturday, so I'll, I'll come up Monday. And he went, no, I want you for the cup final. <laughs> I was like, you're, you're kidding me, Ron. You want me to come up for one game and play in the cup final? And they went, yes. So that's what happened. I went up and that's why I had to play in that cup final. And what was the, obviously Brighton, would you say, kind of your Brighton spell was up there with your, your best time? I, it was I was up there as a, in, as a person and just in terms of all the team spirit and the guys and all that, it was it was one of my most memorable times. I was four years there, three years at Rangers, but four years. And although it wasn't the same, I didn't realise my ambition the way Rangers had done. We winning trophies and playing at the highest level, which I wanted to do. It was still great to play at the top level in England and play alongside a lot of great guys. You know, Steve Foster, the captain, Mark Lawrenson, mm-hmm. Michael Robinson and people like that. Jimmy Case fantastic uh, players to play alongside so I, I enjoyed it greatly and I was so glad that actually I did go down to play in English football because that for me that was a great experience and then obviously you moved to Man City were you excited to work with Billy McNeil yeah I was uh, Billy McNeil uh, told me that he tried to sign me for Aberdeen before I went to Rangers so he said that he'd, he'd always wanted me, me to sign but the strangest thing about it was I, I'd, I'd fallen out with the manager at the time uh, maybe you think that's a, a common thing with me falling out with managers but I fell out with Chris Catlin and I was out the first team and I wasn't even training with them right and then all of a sudden on a Thursday it was a Friday morning uh, Sammy Nelson the assistant manager said hey Gordon you're with us this morning and I went really and he goes yeah so it t- I, I went and trained with the first team then we were playing Derby County the next day I was in the squad took me up to Derby I was in the team we beat Derby 4-0 and I scored that day mm-hmm. and um, Billy McNeil phoned me on the, the next day and he said to me I see you were playing Gordon and I went I says yeah I was he goes I made a bid for you last week that's why you were playing maybe and I went oh right that's what it was I was in the team because he made a bid for me so I went back on the Monday and then Chris Catlin the manager came in and said look Gordon Man City I went really I pretend I didn't know you know and he said uh, he said I don't want you to go I went what do you mean he goes well you played so well on Saturday I said but you've not been playing me I said, and I think the only reason you played me in Saturday was because Billy McNeil came in. He went, no, no, no. I said, oh, well, I think that's the case. I says, I'm going to Man City. That's it. So I went to Man City, and believe it or not, it wouldn't be the case nowadays. I took a, pay, a wage cut to go to Man City. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you enjoy your spell there? I enjoyed it. It was very good. I had um, first season I'm there. Uh, it was I finished top goal scorer, and and well, first but I went there in March, so I played. The end of that, the first season I was there, I played the end of the season. And then the following season, uh, I was top scorer that year. But at the very end of that season, I got osteomyelitis, which is a bone marrow infection. Right. And I had to go into hospital. And I was in hospital for about two or three weeks. And then I was at, at home. And I think I think from that point of view, Man City then thought I was finished. I think a lot of people, there, the medical evidence had said, you can't recover from this. You know, I had it. it was a bone marrow infection in my pelvic bone. But I did recover from it. And... I was back playing the reserves when uh, Oldham came and uh, asked if uh, Joe Royal phoned me up and asked if I could go on loan. And you go to Oldham and obviously Joe Royal was there as well, but there's also a young goalkeeper there called Andy Gorham. Did you think then that he would go on and be what he became? I think, I, I knew he was talented. I mean, the thing about Andy was, see the first few training sessions I actually played with, it was at Oldham, the first few training sessions, I didn't realise he was a goalkeeper. 
because he was actually um, playing outfield in, in the matches we were having. So uh, that shows you that he was he could play outfield or goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. But it was uh, it was funny because I didn't know. I'll tell you why he was he was known to me that time because uh, the only penalty I missed in my whole career, he saved it. Uh, yeah. When I was playing for Man City against Oldham, he saved my penalty. Fortunately, uh, later in the game, I scored past him. So I, I, I got a good goal past him. But it was quite funny because a few years, I hadn't seen him for years and years after that. That, that I was only there for a few months, but I could tell he was talented. I was in a hotel in Glasgow and I, I'd ordered a drink. And next thing, the guy came up and put a little note down and said, you're the worst penalty taker ever. And I said... I said, somebody give you this to give me. He went, yeah. He goes, was it Andy Gorham? He goes, how do you know that? I said, it had to be. <laughs> He's the only one that saved one. So, but he was, he could tell he was talented. I think, I think the big problem Andy had though, seeing it in terms of English football, they always want goalkeepers. I know this from being an agent at the time. If you're not six foot two plus, mm-hmm. uh, they're not interested in you. That's why I think Andy had to come to Scotland to make his name. And uh, he was so talented. He really was a great goalkeeper, no doubt. Yeah, definitely. How did the move to Austria come about with Mira? Where Mira? It was quite funny because I, I, my, Billy McNeil had, had told me about a club being interested, and he and he said what the money was in Austria, and I said no, I'm not, I'm not going to Austria. And what happened was when we went to Oldham, there was Dave Fairclough who played for uh, Liverpool at one time. He was called the Super Sub. He used to come on and score goals. He was playing for Oldham, right? And he he said to me, my first week I was in there, he said, I hear you turned down going to Austria, and I went, how do you know that? He said. He says, oh, the agent that took me to Switzerland, he said, uh, told me that he was trying to get you to Austria. And I went, have you got his number? And he said, yeah. So I phoned the guy up, Helmut Epp, his name was, and I phoned him up and said, Austria. And he went, yes. And I, he said, I said, they're still interested. I could be interested. And he went, yes. So we did the did the deal, negotiated over the phone, and I decided to go to Austria. I quite fancied that, because at that mm-hmm. stage, Scott, I was going to be a, I was thinking about being a coach. Yeah. And I thought myself, getting a bit of European experience mm-hmm. would be good to go and play in Europe and play for a team like Admira Wacker in Austria. And how did you find it over there? I enjoyed it. The, only, the hardest part was that when I went over there, there was, was not one of my teammates or the manager or anybody at the club, apart from the chaplain at the club, spoke English. Right. So that they all. So the, what happened was that it was a bad thing to start with, but it was the best thing about it was the fact that I was then under pressure to learn German mm-hmm. in order that I could communicate with people. And I learned German pretty quickly. And, and got really into it because if you're, if you're not using it all the time, you don't learn it as quickly, but I did. And by the time I, I went to Switzerland about a year later, they thought I'd been speaking German all my life because I was fluent by then. So because I really got into, into it and I, because I wanted to become one of the guys, but I enjoyed the football. The, the strange thing about it was the team at Mira Vaca, there was an amalgamation of two clubs. It was Admira and, and Vaca were two different teams and they joined up. Now their, their crowds were about 8,000 each right mm-hmm. and when they joined up the crowds became 6,000 so it gives you it's a great demonstration of the fact that see if, if two clubs join they don't necessarily always get the fans to come with them mm-hmm. and that's what happened there you know what I mean the, a lot of the fans just think that's not my team anymore so the crowd was 6,000 we got when their actually combined support was about 14 so the club were a bit short of money and, and after about after I've been there about 15 months they asked me and the two foreign players who were playing there two Yugoslav boys to leave because of the the money situation. So my agent got me to a uh, Baal in Switzerland, or Basel as everybody calls it. So I went over there, but it was handy for me because it's a German part of Switzerland. And because I could speak German, I was comfortable going there. Yeah, and how was ba- how was Switzerland as well? Was that another good spell your career? I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was good. Not as good a team, but ba- ba- uh, Basel where were bringing through a lot of young players. I was brought in because they wanted to bring in some experienced players. Whereas a team in Austria, we're, we're an experienced team and it was a good team. We, we actually qualified for Europe uh, from, from where the Miedewacker would get into Europe. First time they'd ever been in it. But in Basel, it was different because the, the team were, and, and a lot of the boys, actually a lot of them went on to become top class international players. But at the time, they were all just kids when I was playing. So it was me and, and a couple of other boys, foreign players came in, a German boy, and uh, another a, a Spanish lad as well came in as well, Enrique Mata, and we were the experienced players, but all the rest were just kids. And then obviously you, you came back to Scotland and finished your career at Stirling. Did you have a plan for what you were going to do after playing? No, I, I was still in was just because it was Jim Fleeting that got me to go there. I knew Jim Fleeting uh, from my days, even in Ayrshire, living in Ayrshire and all that mm-hmm. thing. And he said to me, will you come and play for, for, for some games for Stirling? 
and I went and played there. I had no ambition to play there at all. I actually came back. The one disappointment I had was I was very fit when I came home from Switzerland and I couldn't get a club. The two things was my age. I was 34 and people were just saying, oh, we sign you at 34. We'll get stick from our supporters. A couple of managers told me that. Right. And the other ones are saying, well, you know, you're past your best. And I said, I'm, test me against your players because we they see, the, see the fitness regime, Scott, in, in Austria and Switzerland, miles ahead of what it was in the UK at that time. Mm-hmm. UK has improved since with the sports scientists and all that, but we used to have medical people when, like testing us and actually giving us like you know training routines and all that sort of thing. So that's what happened, and it was very much a case of when I came home from Switzerland, I was as fit as I'd ever been, but I, and I had, the opp- I had the opportunity to stay in Switzerland when I had a club. I could have gone to Germany as well. Schalke were interested in me, but I wanted to come back to Scotland at that time when the family were back here. Yeah. And what happened was uh, I couldn't get a club, and that's why I came out of the game at that time. And then obviously you get into coaching at St Mirren for three years as an assistant with like Sir Tony Fitzpatrick, David Hay and Jimmy Bowen. What was your memories of those those times? Is that a good start in coaching? It's a good experience. I, I knew Tony just from being a coaching course him and Tony invited me. Frank McGarvey had left to become uh, a manager at Queen of South and Tony invited me to be his assistant. I really enjoyed it. I, 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 I had loads of ideas that I wanted to put into the game and Tony was allowing me to do it. But even in terms of the fitness thing, we used to get the players tested so that we could actually determine who were capable of playing at the highest level. Because the thing about it is that a lot of times, because you don't test players, a lot of times they don't realise they might be skillful, but that you know they're not doing. They can't do a full ninety minutes and things like that. So that was very important for me. So I worked away there. Tony left after a year, and then Davy Hay came in, and mm-hmm. Davy wanted me to stay as assistant. So I was happy with Davy to work alongside him. Then he went to America. He left, and then Jimmy Bone came in. Now, Jimmy Bo and I got on fine, but we, we weren't comfortable working together. So right. that's why I, I decided to, to, to leave at that point. Uh, and, and I left and I was thinking about going back into management, but I was getting so much work at that time from in the media and all that sort of thing. That I decided just to, to fulfill my career because most of the jobs I was getting offered were lower lower tier jobs in football and the money wasn't that good. So I was I was trying to build my career back in financial services, which I'd been doing before I went yeah. to St. Mirren and also the media work, and that's what I did for a while. And then I, and then I started the agency work as well at that time, Scott. And what was your favourite experience as well in the media? Uh, it, was, it was good. It, just, it was an amazing thing, that, uh, just working uh, alongside people and, and, and making sure that, you know, I, I, I was always impressed when I was working to try and make sure that, you, you know, you're explaining to people things that were going on. So it was a lot of good experiences, you know, as I say, I, I, I followed a lot of football then. I was out, I was out all the time watching matches and all that sort of thing, and it was it was great. I mean, sometimes with the with the, some of the commentators, it was funny because uh, I, I did a piece. Alistair Alexander died recently, who I worked alongside, and and I, and I was very complimentary of him. But the funny thing was about Alistair was I, I really found out quite early on that he wasn't really listening to me. Mm-hmm. I think I was just a no, I was just annoyed while he was having a wee break, you know. And I, I realised that one day when it was uh, it was the Scottish uh, League Cup final, and they went to penalties, and um, Paul McStay put the ball down to take the penalty, and the referee made him uh, put the ball, shift the ball again from where he put yeah. it, you know. And Alistair said, "Oh, he's got to move the ball, Gordon." I went, "Yeah." I says, uh, "I says obviously he put the ball down. It was upside down there, Alistair, and uh, no reaction from him at all, right?" <laughs> <laughs> and everybody ran about. Everybody ran about. We were sitting, was laughing at me saying that, but. Alistair never reacted, and that, and that was at the point I thought, he's not listening to a word that I'm saying, you know. <laughs> but it was good, I enjoyed doing the media stuff, it was good. Brilliant. You also got an agency as well, it was, uh, was there any transfers that you were involved in that, that didn't happen, that you that was so close, like, there's always something that interests me, like near, near misses with transfers and things like that? Uh, there's, there's always, there was always a few, I mean, things, some of the times, I mean, what happened with you, uh, uh, players... I've had players dr- driving to the club in, in, uh, before midnight on the, the when the window's closing, mm-hmm. and I'm negotiating on, on the phone while the players driving there. And it was a case of saying, uh, phone them up and saying, "Hey, turn your car around and come home. Deal's off, <laughs> or really? keep going. The deal's on. Get there before midnight. You know what I mean? That's the thing. It was quite funny though. One of the ones which funny was the uh, it was a, I was down in England and and uh, I, I was going to see a club down in England for a player and it was to try and work out what kind of money he was on. So I phoned a friend of mine who had played with me at Oldham and he was now in the, in the PFA. So right. I phoned him and I said, look, I know you've got all the contracts there. 
I said, uh, what sort of money uh, are they on at this club? And he goes, well, I, I, I can't tell you who's on it. I said, no, I don't want it. Just, it's just the limit. So he, he phoned me back and he said, I've checked all the contracts. The highest paid player is on £12,000 a week. And I was like, okay, that was about 20 years ago, right? You know, so different nowadays, obviously. But uh, So I, phoned, I went to see the club and the manager, the, the chairman said to me, they were sitting with him, he goes, um, right, he said, we want your player really here. He says, um, we're going to make your player the, the highest paid player at the club. I said, oh, that's really good. I says, right, fine. He goes, what, what's the deal? And he goes, right, we'll give £10,000 a week, he said. I went, 10000 He went, yes. I said, uh, is that the highest paid player? And he went, yes. I says, no, it's not. What do, what do you mean? I says, it's your highest paid player is 12000 How do you know that? You know, and I said, it doesn't matter how I know it, but I now know you're lying to me. So can we start negotiating again? And I got 15. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that just showed you, unless... If you, unless you get the knowledge, Scott, you know, a lot yeah, of times you can imagine how often you'd be stitched up. Definitely. See the chief executive job at the SFA, do you remember how that came about and how did you feel about getting that job? Well, what happened was it, it was Josh Pete, the president, met me. I was in Hamden one day and he said, Are you applied for the, the, the chief exec job? I said, no. And he says, why not? And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not really interested. I'm fine with what I'm doing. He goes, I'd quite like you to apply for it and come in. And I said, when are, when are the interviews? And he said, Friday. And I said, where are they? And he said, here at Hamden. I said, George, if I come along, everybody would know why I'm there. Mm-hmm. If I don't get the job, it'd be embarrassing. Forget it. I'm not interested. So then about an hour later, I got a call uh, from uh, a, a recruitment company saying, hey, we understand you would come for an interview. I said, no, no, I'm not coming. He said, well, we'll have it in our office on Monday then. If you come to our office on Monday, we can have the interview there. So I went along and I was quite nat- relaxed about it because see when you don't think you're not born with getting the job. It's a lot easier to do an interview than if you're actually desperate to get it. So what happened was I did my interview and got offered the job. So it was one of those ones. That, uh, things were good for me in terms of what I was doing, media and agency work. It was one of those things that I think, do I really need this? Should I do it? But my heart ruled me in that respect. I thought, I want to do something for Scottish football mm-hmm. and see if I can make any changes. But I went in there and what I didn't realise was that, see, as, as, in a, if you're... And a and chief exec, you can't really make decisions as a chief exec. All you could do was make recommendations mm-hmm. because every decision gets made by a committee or the board. So I'd, I hadn't done my due diligence before I took the job to find that out when I had a lot of ideas I wanted to do. So all yeah. I could do was really, all I could do, Scott, was put my ideas to the committees or board and see whether they would accept them or not. And then obviously we go, we'll go to the, when Alec McQueen leaves and the, there's a new, a hunt for a new manager. You've said on record before that you, Graham Soonish was your first choice. Like, when did you get the feeling that it wasn't the choice for the the committee? I think I think what it was is just basically in terms of the after his interview, after his interview, the the, the, the people who were on the committee sort of felt there was there was two things. They felt that you know uh, one one of the things was that Graham said he didn't want to uh, come to Scotland, and in those days they, they wanted the Scottish manager to be in Scotland, right? right. And, mm-hmm. the second, and the second one was what he was looking for salary wise was more than what they intended to pay. So these were the two factors that went against Graham in terms of getting the job. I, I felt he was my ideal choice, but mm-hmm. th- that was the thing that I couldn't argue against that one. The fact was that these two aspects were not what, uh, the, what the SFA board were looking for. And obviously George Burley gets the job. Like, what was, how did you go in with George Burley? And like, why do you think it never worked out for George at Scotland? It's hard to say. I, I think it's just a different type of job. But I, I think George, you know, was a good guy. He knew the game well. And, uh, we, you know, we had to pay compensation because we got him from Southampton. He was yeah. doing well in English football. So I think it was just one of those things. Although when you look back at it, he was very close. I mean, we, I think he, he was only like, was it goal difference? I think he failed to qualify for the World Cup when he was when he was a manager. So it wasn't as bad as, as what a lot of people make out. I think it's just because of that time we were so close to the fact of being a qualifying team mm-hmm. that managers were under more pressure to get something done then than they would be in later days when they're saying, well, we haven't qualified anyway for years and years. Different managers have failed to qualify. I was disappointed when Alec McLeish decided to leave. Yeah. But when Alec told me, I mean, I, I actually asked him why he was considering leaving. And then he told me what he was going to get paid at Birmingham. Mm-hmm. And then I realised why he was considering it was a big factor, you know. And then, obviously, yeah, one thing that you done well was a home nations agreement. A lot of play, Scotland players have now kind of played for Scotland because of that. Is that something you're proud of installing? Yeah, I think it was good to do that because what happened was it was just an idea. We had been against all, all the other countries 
where had brought in the element of the fact that after so many years of a player coming to play in your country, if he played for, I think, beyond three years, he could then take citizenship and then he could play. So we, as the four home nations, we, we decided not to go down that route. We decided that we would, players would still qualify under the current rules, which is born in the country, um, grandparent or parent. Mm-hmm. That was what the criteria was to play for Scotland or play for England, Wales or Northern Ireland. So that was it. But what happened was I then came up with the idea saying, it's a shame there's a lot of these kids come over here quite young and their, their, parent, their families have emigrated to, into Scotland or England or whatever, and we, we're not going to be able to consider them because, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're not, uh, they weren't born or parents here or anything like that. And what I said to, I, I put forward the case to the home associations, let's bring in MD that's been five years of education in the country means that they're actually now living here and they're actually becoming a citizen here and then they can play for the country and that was agreed by the home associations and that's that's still the regulation now. Brilliant. We'll move on to obviously when you when you left this job, do you how do you look back on your time at the SFA? I think it was good. I, I enjoyed certain aspects of it. You know, I was also involved in negotiating the biggest deal they'd ever had for the the the, the Media TV rights as well. Yeah. I was involved in doing that with George Pete. We we uh, took that on board, and we get the best best deal Scotland's ever had. And uh, there was other there was other aspects that as well that that I was I was pleased about that. You know, we obviously still weren't qualifying for tournaments, but the other one of the other things that I, I spoke to the players about it, and and the board of directors said I had a meeting and I, I told the board what I was going to do. They said they'll never agree to it. I said I'm going to go to the players and ask the players not to take any fee for playing for Scotland. And, and I said, what do you do? I said, I'm going to say, don't take a fee. And if we qualify for a big tournament, because of the money that's coming in, we'll give you a bonus mm-hmm. for qualifying. And the, I was told it wouldn't happen. And then I went and spoke to the players, got a committee together of the main players in the Scotland team and got the agreement and they gave up earning any money for playing for the country. Brilliant. Well, look at your, your next job, obviously, you... You go to Rangers to be the director of football. When obviously it's the transitional summer for David Murray to Craig White. When do you first hear of that position coming up? I didn't hear about it at all. What happened was I'd, I'd met a, I was out at a place one night and I met a Craig White. I was introduced to him right. and all that. And then the next and the next thing was just said hello and everything. Next thing was I got a call from him and he somebody had given him a number and he said I'd like to have a meeting with you. And I said okay, so I went to meet him in Glasgow in a hotel, and what would, he, did, he asked me about the structure of a football club and all that, and I said to him, I said, look, it's not really happening much in Scotland. It's more happening down in England and more abroad. That a director of football is the kind of position where somebody comes in and they look at overall the running of a club and actually how, how, how somebody controls all the different departments. And then he said, that's quite interesting. Then about a week later, he phoned me up and asked to meet me again. And when I went to see him this time, he said, I, I, I agree with what you're wanting um, and, and, and I agree with what you've suggested in terms of a director of football and I want you to be the one and I said well I'm not sure about that and I, I couldn't I couldn't make my mind up at first but then I agreed and I took the job then uh, not knowing where it was going sort of thing mm-hmm. so I took the job that was the summer of July uh, 2011 Yeah You mentioned then you had a couple of meetings with Craig White what was your first what was your first kind of impressions of him? I think he seemed a nice guy. He seemed as, as if he was very keen and doing well. He wanted to talk about it. I only met him a couple of times, I say, say on my own. Most of the other time was with the chief operating officer, it was Ali Russell, mm-hmm. had been brought in as well. And in other times, it was, it was Ali McCoy was there too. Ali McCoy met him more on his own. But I, I, I only met him. But the thing was, it was when football started, the season started, and discussing to him, I, I really became aware that he was not a football person Mm -hmm. he was not really he didn't really understand the game I don't think he'd ever really followed football so that that's why I realized then he was just in for business purposes as opposed to football and then obviously that summer the one thing you might remember was the the transfer bid there was a lot of transfer bids that were ridiculously low do you remember kind of who was responsible for that and why why they were so low yeah it's just it's just a case of saying what they were doing was you know, this is this was the kind of money they were willing to to do to, to to spend, and that was the spend was going to be a low figure unless you could get, get money in for other players. So that that was it. I, I was I wanted to be involved. That one of the things I wanted to do was be more involved in that. Mm-hmm. And I kept. It's the funny thing. What happened, Scott, was I, I did on 
maybe about two or three occasions I went to my, my reports. This is what, how we should run the club. And my report was basically was that I should be overall in charge of every department and scouting, uh, transfers, everything. And I should be controlling that. And, he, and, he, and each time he said, yeah, we'll, we'll get round to that, Gordon. We'll get round to it. That's what he kept saying. And we never did. We, you know, I kept telling him that. And I mean, I had months there of, I was bringing in players to be fair and for, for trial periods. Yeah. I would, I would, I would get in touch with uh, Ali McCoy, who I always felt should make the decision mm-hmm. about who should come in and trial. And I'd say, look, here's, here's the players we can get in for you to look at. Some of them were international players and such. Bring them in, have a look at them. And if you like them, then we can negotiate. And a few of them came in. And he didn't. He didn't take men. It was only one. I think it was the only one. I think it was Luko. That's who it was. A Luka was the only one mm-hmm. that he actually he came in. I brought him in, and then they decided to keep him. But nobody else get kept on. So that was a, that was the problem with it. As I say, I, I would. But my, my regret is that you know I'm in a position there that you think you've got control, and I never really had control, Scott. Yeah. What was your relationship like with Rally at that point? Was it? Could you see that he was on? Like, I'm maybe explaining this wrong. Could you see that? Ali would. Did you think Ali would go on and be a good manager at Rangers? It was hard to tell. I think. I think myself. I was hopefully he would. He would because, as I say, he was inexperienced in one respect, but he'd also worked alongside Walter Smith. Yeah. Who he must be learning something when you work alongside him. Neen Durant was there, you know. And so they were actually, you know, they were, they were experienced. But it was just a case of I think that you know he had problems in terms of just determining who, you know, who would get in, who should be coming in, and all that sort of thing. So. You know, he did have a good lead. He had a good lead at one stage in the, in the league, and then yeah. that league started to drop off. The biggest problem, I think, and, and it's quite funny, I never realised at the time, I thought, because I was new at the club and didn't know Craig White that well, I thought his disappointment was for the football side of things when we lost to Malmo mm-hmm. in the Champions League. Yeah. One game, and we'd have been in the group stages. Mm-hmm. And then I realised later on, it was totally down to the finance. And you know when, did I mean? you, when did you get the first kind of feeling that it was... Something going to happen. When I got the first feeling was it was a problem was um, when I went there at first, we went to Germany. And that was my first week in, in, in the job, Germany for the pre-season trip, right? Mm-hmm. And I went out there just to try and meet people and say hello. And I got to know, because it was in Germany, I got to know the, the people who ran the hotel. It was just a family hotel. Right? Mm-hmm. The mother and son ran the hotel. Because I could speak German, I got uncomfortably with them. And then about October... Uh, that was July, October. I got uh, an email from the chap because I'd given them my card. An email from the, the son saying, uh, We've not been paid yet for the stay. Rangers haven't paid me. So I was like, I couldn't believe it. So I went to see the financial people in Ibrox and I said, Look, these people have not been paid. And they said, Well, we've been told not to not to pay any any debt at the moment. I said, That that was July. These people have been owed that money since July. And he said, Well, I've been told. And I said, Well, I want this paid. I wanted to speak to it. He says, well, it was Mr. White that was obviously telling him not, you know, Craig White was telling him not to pay things. I said, I want you to get this paid because I said, that's ridiculous. So I never had any more about well, a week later, <clears throat> excuse me, I got an email from the guy saying we've been paid. So it got paid because I made a fuss about it. Mm-hmm. But then I began to wonder, I did begin to wonder how many other people right. are in a similar scenario they're not getting their money. The January transfer window, you might remember, obviously, yellow, which gets sold, and there's a bit of a fast to get a striker, if you remember. Like, is that another red flag at that point when there's no a player like yellow, which is leaving, and they, you kind of get a replacement then? Uh, certainly, that was that was definitely the case. You know, they couldn't get they couldn't buy a replacement, and then we'd sold the player. I mean, I don't even know where the, where the money went for the for the yellow, which deal because I wasn't involved in it. And that's why I was that's why I was a bit annoyed about things like that because I felt that in my role I should have been involved in the mm-hmm. sale, purchase and sale. You know, so because nowadays a lot of teams have a recruitment person. It's recruitment. Now the director of football could do that as well. And I felt I was capable of doing that job as well. But I was I got left out. I didn't know what was happening with it, didn't wasn't getting information. So I was beginning to see things happening then. And that's why when the whole thing blew up in the beginning of February. I just, I just walked out, and then at that point, that what was the reaction? Can I in your department when that news came through? Like, do you remember who told you about administration? Yeah, what happened was I tell you what happened. He, he was having a meeting with the with the different groups, the first team group, all the coaches and players, and everybody else at the club, the youth setup and all that, and their coaches. 
with the first meeting with the, with the youth people at Murray Park, and we, he, he told them, there's a lot of talk about administration, but I don't think it's going to happen. We're going to come through this. That's what he actually said at the meeting. Then between the, that meeting and going to the next one, he got a phone call and he was like away on his phone, perturbed. And eventually I said to Ali Russell, I said, look, Ali, I said, these people are waiting for the second meeting here. They're ready. And he goes, I'll go and find out what's happened. And then he came back and said that the phone, the phone call he got was putting the club, to, get, being told the club was going to the administration. That's how exactly how it happened. When he was telling people it wasn't going to happen, it did happen. It's crazy. It's just yeah. some of the... What's the kind of thing, thing that sticks out about that, that job to you? Was it, do you regret taking it at the beginning? And did you feel was like as soon as you were in, it was just a, a doomed... Yeah. Period? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I definitely regret it. It was one of these ones that I had so much in terms of what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. in terms of how I felt I could take the club forward. Because, but it, there is a lot of people. I mean, I can definitely tell that there is a, a spirit in the game where people don't want a director of football in there. Mm -hmm. They don't feel they want somebody in doing that position. Whereas I feel it is correct because the 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 the, the chief exec is not always capable of doing all the football stuff. Whereas yeah. with my experience in the game, having been a player, a coach, a, a scout, a, you know, chief exec of the SFA. I felt I had something to offer that position and I felt I could take the club forward in the right way, Scott, if I could get it. But I never got I never got put in, you know, things that I wanted to do in, in terms of the strategy I had in place. I never got put in that in and that's what annoyed me and that's what still frustrates me that I didn't show exactly what I could do in that job. You know, I'd be, yeah. probably be criticised more than anything else because people didn't know exactly what I was doing. Yeah, definitely. See, after that job, did you have a... What was the plan after that? Did you plan on getting back into football at some point? It was plans for that to do that if it, if it came along. I had, I had a couple of people talking to me about going down to jobs, but as I say, it was, it was a case of I, things are going again up here in terms of work I was doing and the media work again, doing media work and all that thing. So I was determined just to try and stay here. There wasn't any much of a chance of a, a director of football job in Scotland because it, it's, it's taken longer for that to come through and it also means money to the clubs for, but in England it's a lot easier to do it if I'd been willing to go down to England I might have been able to do it but as I say I turned down jobs before in England uh, years ago when I, uh, even when I came out of management in Scotland with St Mirren I got offered jobs down in England Aston Villa job assistant manager's job offered to me and Portsmouth assistant manager and I, I didn't take either of them so you know there was things like that that I could have done and kept myself in the game but I, I've just said I've got other things to do and yeah. other 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 business to be involved in, you know. Definitely. See, outside the football, though, like, like, do you still keep us busy? Like, are you still busy all the time? Yeah, still doing some stuff, uh, working in, in business things. I'm doing some stuff with people who do people in the medical side of things, and also in terms of uh, security cameras and all that thing. And of late, I've been helping people with uh, doing PPE as well. Yeah. People are doing that, so I think so. I'm helping with that too. I'm still doing uh, radio uh, and a newspaper column in the in the Herald. Uh, so I'm still busy enough to do it, so I think so. I'm, I'm enjoying things. I'm settling down. I'm getting to an old age now, so I'll be uh, don't want to be doing too much, you know. Definitely. What's been your thoughts on kind of football this season? Were you are you kind of surprised at how it's how the seasons went? Or like the Rangers win the league and Celtic and a fall the way they did. Totally a surprise. It was. I mean, I mean, it's been a fantastic season for Rangers, but the fact is that I, I felt at the beginning of the season the big debate was. Can Rangers challenge this season? Mm -hmm. That's what most people were thinking. Can they challenge? And, it, and it's gone beyond the challenge. I mean, it was like unbelievable that how Celtic could be such a strong team. Basically, the same players have had all these other years winning championship and trophy after trophy, four quadruple trebles and stuff like that. And yet they fall away like that. That, that was the most stunning aspect of it. It's all very well for Rangers to have improved so greatly and be challenging, but it wasn't even as much of a challenge from Celtic. They just didn't challenge for the league at all, and Rangers comfortably won it, deservedly so. I don't know whether there's anything to do it. It's been an interesting fact to see whether no crowds there were a factor here in terms of, you know, some players are more comfortable maybe not playing in front of a crowd, especially for the old firm, because you have to be able to put up with a bit of a stick you'll get if you're not doing the right sort of thing. So you don't know whether some of these players have actually had their best season because of that. Yeah, definitely. Are you all right closing with some quite fire questions, Gordon? Yes, on you go, yeah. Brilliant. Your whole career, who would you say was the best player you ever played with? Uh, probably, I'd say David Cooper was the best, most talented 
more skillful. You know, there's others that I enjoy playing with Matt Lawson, as I said before, and and people like Jimmy Case and people like that, Mick Robinson, but uh, and, and even Rangers, other Bobby Russell, and all these people were, were excellent. But Coop was Coop was definitely the most talented. Brilliant. Best player you ever played against? Uh, well, I played against a few. The Juventus team had a few Tardelli and all that. But the best player I think in terms of of, of playing against was Mario Kempis uh, for Valencia. Uh, we know he's, he's World Cup winner, obviously, with Argentina. He was the best player. I played against him in Austria as well. Brilliant. Favourite away ground you've ever played at? Uh, I think it was playing uh, San Siro in uh, in Italy against Juventus. The, the stadium was amazing. The, the atmosphere was electric. I loved it. You know, I, I really enjoyed playing. Although we didn't have a big support that night, it was just fantastic to play with the noise that was coming from the stadium. So that's, that's my favourite away ground. Brilliant. Either in the media or just watching football, the best player you've ever seen live? Uh, best player I've ever seen live is Lionel Messi. You know, he, uh, Maradona was ahead. You know, I loved, I never saw Pele live, but I loved Pele when he was watching TV. Maradona was fantastic, but I think watching play live, I've been at games, two games in Barcelona, and Lionel Messi is stunning to watch. And I think, you know, he's just the best player I've ever seen live. Brilliant. Interesting fact about yourself that nobody will know. Um, interesting fact about me, nobody will know. Um, well, I was—I was think I was—I was on a, I think what it was on the committee at uh, FIFA, and what happened was that uh, we had a vote. We had to have a vote at FIFA on what was the a non goal, what a non goal should be, right? And I actually. And uh, said, "Here's my theory on it. I think an on goal should be if the if the original effort from the player is on target but deflects, he gets the credit for that goal. Mm-hmm. If the original effort is not on target and deflects in, then that's an on goal. I says even a shot that hits the post, that hits the goalkeeper and goes in, it's an on goal. Whereas up to now, they've always been giving that to the player who has the shot. I said, but in my opinion, that's an on goal. And then what happened was the person who seconded that was Pelly. Right. Pelly stood. Pelly stood up and said, "I agree with Gordon. That's that's what an own goal should be, and that is now the regulations for an own goal. If you check it and they say it all the time on Sky and all that, an own goal is if the original. You need to wait and see whether the original shot is on target or not, or effort. And if it's not, it's an own goal. And that, and, that, and I actually brought that in. So not a lot of people know that. that <laughs> Favorite film and TV show. Uh, well, favourite film is um, Catch Me If You Can, I think it was. And I think that was fantastic. I said, it's, it's because it's a true story. Uh-huh. I actually I actually uh, saw the film. The first time I saw it, I did not know it was a true story. And I thought it was a bit far-fetched, right? I thought, oh, it, it couldn't be able to make up a story like this, you know. Then I found out it was true and I uh-huh. had to watch it again. And it, I think it's one of the amazing stories, yeah. a great film. Definitely. Definitely, I can agree more. Best friend in football? Um, well, I've got, probably my best friend is uh, was was I've got good friends for the football side of things. Jim Melrose, who played at Man City, Derek Parlane, mm-hmm. who was my teammate at Rangers. Derek and I are still pals. He was Man City as well with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, I've got Ian Ferguson, who plays played with uh, Rangers before. I was, after I was there, he played with. Um, uh, Dundee United and Motherwell as well mm-hmm. uh, I'm still friend, friend with Ian too so they, they're probably my best friend I'm still keeping in touch with Steve Forster the captain of Brighton we're still pals down there Brilliant Final question the best manager you played under? Uh, well I played under some good ones uh, I think that uh, Jock Wallace was the best Alan Mullery was up there is really good then Billy McNeil was excellent as well but it was quite funny there was a great line once Marco Van, Bra- Van Basten was doing an interview and they said to Marco Van Basten, you played for uh, eight managers, what were they like? He said, hey, one was great. He says, one was very good. One was good. And I made it in spite of the other five. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that sums up football quite well, Scott. Brilliant. Gordon, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thank pleasure. you. Thanks very much. Get better real soon. Yeah, I'ma just do me, you just do you I swear it's gonna get better real soon Don't
Don't let anyone tell you what you should do. I got a clear view. We're gonna make it soon. Just keep pushing through.